Why don't you grab your seats wherever you are? Good to have you in church tonight. And of course, it's my great privilege to be with you. And uh, it's great to have Pastor Jim here, but also Pastor Mark. He's been on the screen in his Malaysian accent and his Australian accent so far tonight. So he'll come with his London accent later. And uh, I'm allowed to joke like that. I'm his friend, okay? Some of you are like, are we allowed to even joke like that? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. But uh, it's a privilege to be with them because what great leaders they are and what is happening across the nations is being talked about everywhere. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here in this building. And uh, I love coming here. I love how Pastor Chad looks after the building so well, better than even when I was here. And, uh, and uh, no, seriously, he does do a great job. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, we're just so happy to see what God is doing and uh, far superseded anything that we did. Some will plant and some will water. And uh, I tell you, there's great harvest of revival that's coming. This, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. I believe that your greatest days, you talk about 27,000, it won't be long before you're talking of hundreds of thousands of people that are a part of this revival that God is doing. You know, just last week, Pastor Mark was talking and he makes some statements that I love. One of the statements that's written on the miracle offering is revival grows naturally naturally in an atmosphere of generosity. I want you to understand that generosity is the seedbed of the supernatural. And we need to recognize that here we have an opportunity not just to take an offering, but to actually position ourselves by faith. Faith is the tangible tool that actually attracts the attention of heaven. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says. So here's an opportunity, church, not to take an offering, but to exercise faith. So we should get excited because collectively we're going to do something together. What about the fact that the wall was built in 52 days? It had taken hundreds of years just to hold it together. Nobody believed that anything could change, but the, the simple miracle took place because... He encouraged them, Nehemiah, to own their space outside their door. Your space in your workplace, your space in your family, your space in whatever city or, or state or, or, or your place that you're represented. And, and, and as I started to read that, I got so excited about it. And, you know, this brochure, you can look at it and go, oh, well, it's just a brochure. No, this is a great brochure. I don't just mean it's a great brochure. It is a great brochure in design and the way it looks. But it's a great brochure that's full of faith statements. It's full of positioning you for the future that God has planned for you. So tonight, I don't want to just talk to you about some of the statements that are in it, although they're good ones. Not that we give all, but that we all give something. I love that statement. But tonight, I want to talk to you, if you like a topic, if you like a, a title, then write down the power of agreement, the power of agreement. Because you see, this is an opportunity for you individually, but you collectively to come together and recognize that there is power found in agreement. Matthew 18 and verse 18. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there or you can look to the screen. It's going to come up. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Understand that Jesus is setting up a parable here and he's saying that there's a principle that's lived on earth. There's a principle that was lived in Roman society at that time that was taking place. But this principle he wants to show the people isn't just for earth, but as in heaven. It's also a spiritual principle that has supernatural power. So as we read this, we want to focus on the supernatural power that is unlocked. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Church, this is saying it will be done for you. Anything you agree on. What can you agree on? Well, one of the problems that we have in society today is we focus all our energy on the 85, on the 15% that we disagree on. But actually, 85% of what we believe as Christians is all the same. And the enemy's plan is always to get us focused on what we don't agree on rather than what we can agree on. There is power in agreement. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am in the midst. 
It's interesting because really this passage of scripture has been preached from the context of the consistency of the fact that when we gather together, two or three get in a space, whether it be a small group, whether it be in church, whatever campus it is on earth, whether it be here in Wangara or down in Mandurah or wherever you're sitting if you're watching live tonight, and each one of us is in that space, and if there's two or three together, Jesus is in the midst. We just heard some great worship, we were a part of it, we were singing, and, uh, and as we were singing, I don't know about you, but I can get lost in the moment because, oh, you can sense. He's here. You can sense he's doing something. Jesus is in the midst. But tonight I want to focus your attention, understanding you're coming into a miracle offering. How do we consistently see anything we ask for happen? Because this passage of scripture isn't just talking about Jesus is in the midst. It actually starts out by saying anything we ask for can be done. It will be done. So I, I want to leave church each week, not just having Jesus in the midst, but understanding he's in the midst with a purpose because he wants to deliver on whatever we ask for. So church, we've got to rise in our capacity to begin to ask for what God can do. Now suddenly we're not taking an offering. We're standing together and we're actually asking, God, would you give us the nation of Zambia? God, would you do something powerful in, in Indonesia? Would you touch us in Surabaya? Oh, we don't want to just go to Bali to lay on the beach. We want to reach people for the purposes of God. Suddenly we're asking for something more. But you see, the fulfillment of agreement and the power it has was first rolled out in Genesis chapter 11. Interestingly, I want you to understand that this was a group of secular, non-God believing people. But yet, these people attracted the attention of heaven. In fact, more than just heaven. Because in the Old Testament, we see the angels come down on many occasions. But it's only on a couple of occasions that we actually hear of God himself coming down to earth to check out what's happening. So when I read that God himself comes down, as we're going to find here in Genesis 11, then my attention is put on this passage because I say, God, what is it that I can do to attract your attention to my situation? And look here in Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language. Interesting, before sin, we all started with just one common language. But then it says, and a common speech. Interesting again, because the common speech is actually the same word common, and the same root meaning uh, for common as it talks about in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where it says they all came together and had everything in common. And that common was when they came together in common, they actually, um, you know, in that time, that's when we see that there was at least 5,000 added in a day. Why? Because the people forego what they wanted, they forgo what was best for them and they came together and come and put everything together and that's when a miracle came about because of God. So here we have a secular group of people that have learned that if they can speak one language, our oh, kingdom a city has a culture and it has a language. You know, when your pastors get on stage, it's, it's funny, I was just waiting to see because in the first service this morning, I, I, I actually said, um, I said to the team, you know, it's amazing how whenever a pastor gets on stage, anywhere that I've spoken at Kingdom City, they always get up and they say, you know, uh, it's great, I'm a part of the team here at Kingdom City. They don't say, I'm the senior pastor, I'm the campus pastor, I'm the this, I'm the that. They might say that somewhere in there, but it starts with, I'm a part of the team. Why? Because it's a language of the house. And language is so important to command us to head in the same direction. So when we actually get a brochure like this, we need to study it. We need to understand it. We need to read it. We need to get to pages like this. The miracle is not that we give all, but that we all give. And, and, and we need to pull this out, stick it on the fridge, understand that God is wanting to do something. Because language defines us. And as men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinna and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down. Here it is. Came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they had begun to do this, then nothing they planned to do would be impossible. 
Now, church, we've heard nothing is impossible. Most of us refer to the, the, the bit where it talks about nothing is impossible for those who believe in God. And, and it's talking from the book of Luke, chapter 1. It actually is talking about nothing is impossible when Jesus is in the midst. But this is not talking about even having God in the midst. He's saying if we could have one language, a common speech, even without God, nothing is impossible. So I want you to understand we have an opportunity here tonight if we get this revelation to have nothing is impossible and then Jesus in the midst, nothing is impossible. We have a double portion of ability to see his nothing is impossible in our lives. But it goes on and it says, Come, let us go down and confuse their language. This is God. So they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from over the whole earth and they stopped building the city. That it is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The question we need to ask so that we don't fall into the same trap is what disqualified them from God endorsing what they were doing? I want God to put his stamp upon everything that we do. Kingdom City, this is a moment for us to go from 27,000 to hundreds of thousands of people. But we shouldn't think to ourselves that we're any different to these people, that we may be disqualified. What disqualified them was a statement that was in the middle there that said, let's make a name for ourselves. See, the primary objective of our lives is not to make a name for ourselves. The primary objective of our lives is to make Jesus famous. So we've got to recognize that the purpose we assemble in a room like this is because we have one thing in common, language. We have one thing in common, culture. But we have the primary thing in common, and that is that we are worshippers, followers of Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that our primary purpose is to lift up His name. But we live in a world today that is consumed with us, with me, with mine. A hedonistic society, if you go to a university today, we are encouraged to come up with our own view, to come up with the, the why of we should be the type of people that we are and, and, and people's names should be stamped on everything. You know, we live in the generation where there's a family called the Kardashians. I can go to my local shopping, you know, my, to my local supermarket in Melbourne and sometimes I'm sure I just bumped into Kim, Kim Kardashian because somebody has copied her makeup down to a T, her dress sense down to a T but here's the weird thing, the Kardashians have never done anything so we've got these famous people in society for doing nothing Keeping Up With The Kardashians is a show about watching people do nothing all day the second youngest daughter has just become a billionaire for coming up with a, a cosmetic line and, and she's done nothing. She got a company, came and approached her and now they're celebrating. How do you become a billionaire as a Kardashian? You do nothing well. <laughs> I'm not against them, but what I am saying to you is we celebrate things in society today that actually are about nothing. They're about a name. They're about pumping up somebody. And so we're consumed with how many followers we have. We're consumed with what people might think about us rather than lifting up the name that is above all names, <laughs> recognising that he is the one that we're purposed to build. So in essence, to make a name for ourselves is our sin nature. Selfishness comes in. Devoted to caring for one person and that person is me rather than primarily recognizing that our life is about others. Matthew 28 says that Jesus came and when he left he said your primary role now is to make disciples. A disciple is a follower of somebody else. It's not popular but it's true. Therefore not doing what you want to do but actually being subjected to somebody else. So church, we need to recognize that we should live in an environment where we're constantly subjected to somebody else so that we can be transformed more in the image of Christ. But it's counterculture today to be in that environment. So we need to understand the principle of this passage that we find in the book of Matthew because Jesus was speaking to the language of the day. When he was talking about if two of you can come together and agree, he wasn't talking in the nature that maybe we think he was. He was talking to them and saying, as on earth, 
also in heaven. The reason was because he was speaking to Romans. In that time, the Roman Empire was uh, the most powerful empire and he was speaking to people that understood if you were a Roman, you had an adage that said that you would always put Rome ahead of yourself. So they lived in a culture where they could trust that if you were a Roman citizen by birth, you would always put your country ahead of yourself. So then when he's talking to them, now we get the context of what he's saying. If two or more could agree on anything that they felt could benefit the empire, they could bring it to the floor of parliament in Rome at that time. The legal governing authority, the Senate would simply require proof of their citizenship by birth. And as all Romans put the empire above themselves, then the agreement would be read publicly and it would be decreed law. The government's job was to ensure that the agreement was carried out, not that it was debated in any way. So understand this. If we're here in Wangara, we were there in Mandurah, and there was two parents that were down at the local playground. They were here maybe in Woodvale somewhere, and Woodvale's playgrounds were established 20, 30 years ago, and they were a bit run down. And they're a bit old-fashioned, and some of the swings didn't work properly, and two mums were sitting there talking, and they're like, this isn't really the best thing for the community here. They had the power by law to go to West Perth, to Parliament House, to walk in the door, not be stopped by security. As citizens of Western Australia, they would have been able to walk into the Parliament, ask for a time to speak to the Parliament. The two mums could speak to the Parliament. They could say, we need playground equipment in Woodvale area. Hasn't been updated for all these years. And the, the Parliament couldn't debate back and say, why do you need it? The Parliament, all they did was approve it, decree it as law. Their job then was to raise the budget and a time frame for when it was going to be installed. So when Jesus is coming and he's walking around the room because he's in the midst and he's looking for some people that will ask him for some things... Suddenly we recognise that this scripture isn't saying, well, when two or three come together, Jesus is there because he's a lovely guy. He's there because he's looking to endorse some questions that people are asking him for. Suddenly we get a context that's entirely different. But we don't operate this way in society today and the Romans only did for 54 years because after 54 years, guess what? Sin got in. And some of the Romans probably thought to themselves, oh, I could build a palace. Let's go, mate. Let's Two of us, let's go to Parliament. And uh, if we both endorse it, we can get one. In fact, let's get two and then we'll separate at some point down the track. And because of corruption, they closed this law down. But when Jesus was speaking, he was speaking as on earth, also in heaven. So we need to understand that the greatest threat to agreement is simple. It's opinion. Opinion is the destroyer of agreement. You see, a personal view. We don't like talking like this. And when I do talk like this, rooms like this always go a little bit quiet. Ooh, you're saying we're not allowed to have an opinion. Well, you see, the problem is that many of us do have an opinion about everything. In fact, if we watch the news today, now we've become so politically correct that everybody's opinion is valid, but nobody's opinion has any weight. So now we can't do anything. We're crippled in society. We're caught in a place where what do we do and how do we do it? Language is an interesting thing because if we asked your opinion on what you thought on the English language on some words, you would not like the you would say, I don't think we should say that word. I've got one particular. Let's get the elephant out of the room. Elephant. I don't like the word elephant. I've seen an elephant. When I look at an elephant, there's nothing in me that makes me feel that when you say elephant, that represents that big grey mass of an animal with a trunk. You don't care. You're like, what are you talking about? Don't be ridiculous. Well, I could say the same about some of your opinions on things. You see, it's interesting how when we're not consulted on something, we just accept it. But when we're asked for our opinion, oh, then suddenly we all want to have an opinion. We all want to have a view. If I was to say to you, why are are kingdom cities, auditoriums always so black? I mean, seriously, they're black. Just by the way, so are planet shakers. But anyway, I'm just saying that. And why are they so black? If I was to ask some of you what colour, some of you would say, you know, it could do with a pop of colour. Why don't we paint that wall over there a really bright pink? 
And some of you go, don't be ridiculous. I like the black. And then others of you. And in fact, in a room like this, if there was hundreds like this that I said, let's paint that wall. Or down there in Mandurah, I said, let's paint this wall. What colour? You would say, all of you are different colour. So guess what? We don't ask your opinion. But you don't ask my opinion for what colour your loungers should be. So just get over it. It doesn't matter. There's so many things that we're trying to get our nose into that don't matter. And we need to recognise that opinion is only required when there's insufficient grounds to produce a complete certain outcome. So it's important that you understand that much time is wasted discussing opinion. But we must remember there's power found in agreement. So the enemy's great to plan is to distract us from what is power, which is agreement. The 85% of what we all believe in and all agree to, and we get caught up with a little bit over here. Well, I don't know that I agree with that. And why does it say that? And I don't think that's the interpretation of what it's saying. Rather than actually focusing on what we can agree and where the power is. But the second part is that we must understand that expression is encouraged. We want people to express themselves. We want people to understand that there's got to be different types of people. There's the huggers in church. I'm not talking about inappropriate huggers, just huggers. Some people are just huggers. They can't help themselves. Don't come near me after the service. But, you know, those people who just hug everybody. There's other people who are, you know, out on the doors and they're the greeters and and they've got a smile on their face. Thank God for them. It's nothing worse than when you go to a church, and I go to a lot, and the person who is actually greeting you on the door just doesn't even give you a moment of, he's like, here's the brochure. Yeah, good good to have you in church tonight. Doesn't really make you feel welcome, but the person who reaches out and encourages, what about worship leaders? You could have had me lead worship tonight. That would have been a disaster. Because that's not my expression. So in church life, we need to express. We, we, the greatest example of expression is, is God himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. There's an expression of each of them and each is required, but it doesn't take away from any of them. But most of us are consumed with what doesn't matter. But the third part is leadership is required. Without vision, people perish. Last week, Pastor Mark presented to us A vision. The good thing about it is it's good soil because we've seen the proof of it. But you see this vision that we've had, rather than looking through it and going, well, I like that. Oh, I don't know about that. Why would they use those words? Oh, why are we supporting those people? I don't know. Oh, that country. I don't even like that country. Don't they realize that that was war-torn once and what are we wasting money there for? And oh, Oh, we can pick it up and go, wow. Look at what I'm a part of. Wow, look at what God is about to do. Wow, look at what he's already done as Pastor Mark Lassie said. And now look at what he's about to do. And Wow, God, we want to get behind all that you have for us. You see, it's a different approach. But we have leadership. We have board here at church. We, we have people that look over the spiritual governance of the whole church. The campus pastors get together and discuss you. And they represent that some of you would like pink and some of you would like black and somehow they come together and work out what is best for the collective rather than getting consumed with my. What do I get? My name being lifted up. Why wasn't I consulted? The greenhouse effect is what Pastor Mark has been talking about. Nehemiah building the wall in front of your own house. You know, play your part. It talks to me like agreement. Something that we can all get involved in, that we can all play a part. And suddenly there's power that is unlocked when we're in agreement. Oh, this outrageous miracle is not that we give all, but that we all give. And you see what the Lord is doing. He's causing us all to be in a position, whether it's somebody in Cambodia that may be able to give just a small amount or it's somebody in one of our more Western type countries that's able to give a lot larger amount. It's about us all standing together because it's a statement. It's a word of agreement. Us speaking and saying, God, we're asking that you would come into our situation. But you see, the word agreement actually literally means in the Cambridge Dictionary an undivided opinion. 
So if we're going to actually bring that sense of harmony, that sense of purpose, that sense of vision that God has purposed for us, then we need to come to a place where we can agree. We look at what we can agree rather than spending the time on what we can't. An undivided opinion. But there's another meaning to this word and it's up there. It's a legal contract that is accepted by parties to facilitate a transaction. Help me, let me help you understand what that means. If you were to put your house on the market, you wanted to sell your home, and on a Saturday afternoon there was a home open and your house sold, you all know that you sell it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At 3 o'clock you're not expecting a knock on the door from the people who bought it and say, hey, we're here, it's our house now. You've got to have time to move your furniture out. You've got to get things sorted out with the bank. You've got to get legal contracts in place. And so usually a settlement period is somewhere between 30 to 90 days. You don't drive around that house at any point and think it's yours until settlement has happened. But here's the thing about an agreement. Once an agreement is written, it's a legal and binding contract. But the problem that we have as a church is we don't know how to wait. So we come into church and we say, God, would you come and would you heal me in my body? God, would you set me free of whatever it is, the sickness that's in my body? Somebody else prays for us. We're full of faith. We walk out the door. Something happens the next day and we say, well, it didn't really happen. But actually what this passage of Scripture is simply saying is that God has already automated the process. He's already allowed the process to happen. An agreement has taken place. And we might not see it today, but I tell you, it might be 30 days, might be 60 days, but he's already put it in place and he's already accepted that that healing is coming. That breakthrough is coming in your finances. He's already accepted that something's about to shift over your life. So our job is to come together in agreement and ask. The question is not, what are you going to give in two weeks' time? The question is, what are you asking for? What are you asking for? Oh, I'm asking for Zambia. I'm not just asking for a campus. I'm asking for a nation. What are you asking for? Well, well, I'm asking for Indonesia. I don't want to just be Bali. I've loved going there on holidays for years. But God, would you bring a revival to Indonesia, Surabaya, Jakarta, Pekinbaru, all these different places that are in that nation. God, would you enable us to be a part? But the authority... The parliament of the day, like the parliament I talked to you about when Jesus said when two are gathered together, the the authority is heaven. And so therefore heaven's job, the Trinity, the God, the Father, God, the Son, the Holy Spirit, is to actually endorse what we've asked for. Your words, when in agreement with his word, have spiritual authority. But as a kingdom of the citizen of heaven, you have an unusual delegated authority. God has actually said, you have my power in your hands. And if you ask, you mix that with my capacity to go to my Father in heaven, you will have what you ask for. So get this, Matthew 18 verse 18 and the Message Bible. Let me bring it together for you here. Take this most seriously. I love the way it says it in the Message Bible. I hope you're still listening there in Mandurah. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I'm telling you, what you say to one another is eternal. I mean this, when two of you get together on anything and all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven, I love this, He goes into action on your behalf. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I will be there. So why is Jesus there? Why is Jesus in the midst? Well, we need to remember that Jesus is the government representative. He's the heavenly authority in the room. So suddenly he has the power to decree what we're asking for. You see, in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Of the increase of his government and their peace, there is no end. So get this. Somebody in the room has arthritis that they put up with for 10 years. You see, we've consistently seen him in the midst, but we haven't consistently seen whatever we ask for come to pass. 
Jesus in the midst, not just to make us feel warm, to make us feel good, to feel like, wow, he's in the room. He's in the midst because he's the government representative and he's looking to take a contract, an agreement. We don't believe that that person should have arthritis anymore. So if two of us, just two of us believe, suddenly Jesus comes in and he says, okay, I've seen that decree. I take that contract to my Father in heaven. It may not happen tomorrow, but I'm telling you, it's already done because it's a legal binding agreement. Oh, I'm telling you in this room, imagine if two or 3,000 people could get together. Imagine if 27,000 people could get together. Suddenly, a miracle offering isn't about money. It's about there's power. Oh, there's power. There's power in agreement.